Wonderful. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm excited to uh, share um, some of my research with you. Um, uh, a couple I, uh, a couple of you, it's also nice to see folks who are not part of the Nordic network who it's me, that's been meeting here the last couple of days. I see, I see some unfamiliar faces, so um, welcome. The other thing I'll say is as I am talking, I am more than happy to, um, if, you, if you have uh, questions, comments, I think we have a total of an hour in, in, the, in the room, so um, if we don't get to everything or I need to jump around, that's okay. I'm more than happy to have a more kind of interactive experience. So especially if you um, want me to say something in a slightly different way or not following what I say, just, just shout out or raise your hand. I'm perfectly comfortable with that. Um, uh, some of you uh, uh, may have seen this paper. Apparently, where's Yotam? Apparently, one of my colleagues said it was blowing up on Twitter in January after it was published. It's called Papers and Patents Are Becoming Less Disruptive Over Time. Um, and so this is a paper that I'm not going to talk about today, um, but it's co-authored um, with um, uh, graduate student Michael Park um, and my co-principal investigator on the NSF grant that supported this research, um, Russell Funk. Uh, and one of the key findings um, from that, that paper, um, you can kind of read on your own, but it is related to what I'll be talking about today, is that disruption in science is on the wane. And we documented this uh, using basically the corpus of kind of, you know, published, published papers um, in the web of science, but other databases as well and in lots of different fields. And then we also examined all um, uh, US patents uh, and found that uh, disruption is also on the wane. And I'll talk a lot more. We talked about a little bit at our um, uh, kind of network meeting in the last couple of days. So I think most of the people in the room are familiar a little bit, but I will definitely unpack it and show you a little bit more about, about the, um, talk a lot about the measure um, and, and even more about the concept. So the paper that I'm going to uh, do a deep dive into today is, I think, coming out on Friday. It's in, um, I'm a sociologist, it's in the American Sociological Review, and the title is What Types of Novelty Are Most Disruptive? And this is with a graduate student of mine, Gina Lee. I've been working with her for five, or five years now, um, and, and Russell Funk at the University of Minnesota in the, in the business school there. So. One scholar or scientist might say, I want to make a new contribution, right? Maybe you've said these things to yourselves before. I want to have an impact on my field. So these are the aspirations of many scholars, key features of the scientific enterprise, and critical forces in the evolution of science. So not surprisingly, the concepts of novelty, the newness, right, and impact dominate theories of scientific change. So I'm gonna spend a few slides diving in pretty deeply into some, I would say, kind of classic sociology of science. This is for you, Petri, um, <laughs> um, uh, to theorize the relationship between novelty and impact. I think a lot of times people see these as one and the same thing and talk about them as the same thing, um, um, but we're trying hard to separate them. So some have argued that a new contribution incorporates previous ideas as it builds on them, perhaps bringing them renewed attention. Right? So this uh, consolidation, we might call it, is suggested by a number of theorists, a number of scholars, including um, Bourdieu, um, Kuhn, in his depiction of kind of normal science, right, where ideas are fleshed out and articulated, um, and other, other scholars and theorists of what, as well have talked about this idea of consolidation and building on previous work, maybe in, I think it always sounds a little derogatory, but incremental way, right, in a, um, an incorporating kind of way. Others argue that a new idea, so that's the, the novelty part of our work, right, that a new idea um, or product effectively replaces the previous idea in a process akin to creative destruction. Um, uh, so this disruption might be suggested by a number of theorists. Um, again, uh, Bourdieu and his idea of risky subversion. Um, Kuhn and his depiction of paradigm-shifting science that reorients fields. Um, Michael Mulcahy. Firebend and, and others. 
Um, Petri, I will tell you that the original draft of this paper that we sent to the original submission um, was very much motivated by Thomas Kuhn's structure of scientific revolutions, which I reread about three times to kind of theorize these effects, and the reviewers weren't having it. So it's a, more of a minor role. I remember your talk yesterday, right, saying, oh, all these works about disruption, but there's no talk of like paradigm shifts and revolutions in science. And we did try to make that connection across the levels, right? Maybe a given paper or patent can be disruptive, but how, how can you possibly have a scientific revolution or something paradigm shifting without, without some disruptive work, right, contributing to it? Um, so it was, it was very much there, and now it's, a, it's less there, um, thanks to reviewer B. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, other scholars uh, have, so some have been looking at kind of consolidation, right, and th you know, theory, theorizing consolidation and more incremental work, and then there's been theorizing about kind of, you know, disruption and change and replacing uh, new ideas, replacing old ideas. And then other scholars have done, uh, especially a lot of qualitative scholars, really unpacked um, uh, kind of novelty, like what is a new contribution? What is a, a novel thing in the realm of science? And they've made distinctions among types of novelty. So some people have focused on new findings or new results, right? And I think that a lot of the traditional sociology of science focuses on discover, the role of discovery. Right, the role of discovery or new results, new findings. So that I feel like is the dominant type of novelty that most people have been looking at. But then there's also um, a focus on new theory, especially by historians and philosophers of science. Um, how a new theory, for example, T prime, might relate to original theory T. Um, and sociologists of science have been especially attuned to new methods and saying we need to we need to focus on the role of new methods and techniques and instruments, right, and the role that they play in scientific advance and progress and evolution. So um, I've appreciated the the focus on the kind of unpacking novel. It's not just novelty, right? Like novel novel what, right? What kinds of novelty? So despite deep advances in data access and computing and the development of sophisticated measures, this is all of what we've been talking about the last day and a half, empirical efforts in the science of science to date, I think, have, um, have fallen short. So uh, other folks met yesterday talked about the relationship between novelty and impact, or maybe it was interdisciplinarity and impact, right? That there's a, a, lot, of, a lot of research that has documented that, you know, um, a work that is, you know, particularly new, if we're looking at the extent of novelty, something that's very, very novel is going to have more of an impact, as typically, for better or worse, gauged by number of citations, right? And there's just a series of papers there, including some of my own, that have documented that novelty has a positive effect on impact. In this previous research, the focus has been on this one dimension of novelty that I call the extent of novelty. This is unidimensional. Um, it's typically um, quantitative. Um, uh, it's reliant on recombinant innovation theory. Again, uh, thinking about my conversation with Yotam yesterday, right, um, that, you know, novelty just, just occurs when two new things kind of are put together that have never been put together before. Um, and uh, the, the things that are put together, these new or unconventional combinations, sorry for the, the truncation there, the combinations can be of lots of different things, right? You know, new fields put together, interdisciplinarity, this is what we're talking about today, right? Um, subfields, topics, patent classes, chemicals, when two new journals, right? So we could think of lots of different things. But that's most of the research on the on novelty, focuses on the extent of novelty, that one dimension, um, and, it's, and it's typically quantitative. And then when people look at impact in the previous literature, it, the focus is on the amount of impact, the level of impact, how much impact does a paper have? How much impact does a patent have? They're quantitative. They're proxy by um, citation counts and often confounded with novelty. People kind of see these as one and the same thing, but we're trying to we're trying to kind of pull them apart in this work. So the question that that leaves um, open that I feel like has been unanswered uh, un, 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 until we came along um, is does the type of novelty, a different dimension, not the extent of novelty, but the type of novelty affect not the amount of impact or the level of impact, um, but the nature of it? Okay. So this is the question we're asked. Does type of novelty affect the nature of impact? And, and we were doing a, um, a paper-level paper analysis um, here. 
Okay, so the previous research is a little bit grayed out, and our research, again, focusing on type of novelty. This is our key independent variable, and we are following the tradition of these kind of theorists, uh, sociologists of science, and, and uh, qualitative scholars unpacking novelty to look at different types of novelty. Does a paper present a new method? Does a paper present a new theory? Or does a paper present a new result? Like, oh, hey, nobody's found this before, right? Like a new finding. So we're unpacking type of novelty, and the key outcome that we are looking at is the nature of impact, right? Not how much impact a paper has had, as gauged by citations. For two papers can have the same number of citations, but one can be consolidating building in maybe a more incremental way, being very much deeply embedded in a stream of knowledge and continuing that stream of knowledge, or uh, the paper with the same number of citations could be disruptive. And a disruptive paper is one that um, leads to the uh, neglect of its foundational work, the stuff in its references, right? It, it, um, people start to pay attention to the paper instead of the foundational work. So it's kind of disguising some of the foundational work a little bit. So I already said all this. Um, the second line here, all papers stand on the shoulders of earlier work, but do subsequent works recognize that? Right? If so, the paper might reinforce or consolidate a stream of literature and enhance that fo prior foundational work. Um, or do subsequent works view the article as distinct in a class by itself, removed from its foundational work? If so, the paper may challenge or disrupt a stream of literature. So a paper that disrupts a stream of literature may present a discontinuity. Um, I, I, um, I've heard it kind of called like a bend in the road, right? If you're thinking of a stream of knowledge as a, as a road, there's a bend in the road. It presents a, a discontinuity. It severs ties to previous work. That's a little extreme. That would be like, you know, maximally disruptive. Uh, it, it is continuous, right? Some papers are more or less disruptive than others um, and maybe renders it obsolete also um, in that extreme form. So that's the nature of impact. It's not the amount. It's not the level. It's not the number of citations, right? It's the nature of the impact. What kind of impact is it having? Which is a very qualitative thing, right? Um, but we capture it with, with, um, with, uh, in, a, in a quantitative way. Thomas Kuhn in Structure of Scientific Revolutions lamented that results, theories, and methods are interwoven and inseparably linked in an inextricable mixture. And these, these things are kind of um, uh, all mushed together and hard to pull about, pull about, pull apart. And in, I think my second or third read of Structure of Scientific Revolutions, Petri, I mean, it was, I, I kept reading it was like, okay, I, I want to understand what does Kuhn have to say about new, like methods and new method. And then the next read, what does he have to say about like theory and theory and result, and really thinking it with this typology in mind of type of novelty. Um, and it, it wasn't as clear as it could have, it could, it could have been here. I don't, uh, anyway, it was really fun to revisit. Um, but we are able in this work to distinguish new results, new theories, new methods, and examine how they may differ differentially affect the nature of impact, which is our outcome of interest. Like others, we doubt that all types of novelty disrupt knowledge flows and lead to the dismissal of previous work, right? So we, these different types of novelty may um, affect disruption differently. So the next three slides, I'm going to just motivate our three hypotheses and then, and then um, uh, move, move into some of the data. So despite the prominent role of new discoveries in discussions of scientific progress, we do not expect new results to have a disruptive effect, right? To disrupt, disrupt a stream of knowledge and create a bend in the road. So new results um, tend to dominate research frontier activity. They epitomize science in the making. They are often part of a chain of results in a very fast moving research front, like this new finding, new finding, building on these uh, new findings. And an, if you have a new result, if you think, oh wow, like nobody's found this before, I have this, I have this new finding, this new result, you must juxtapose that new result with old results, old results, <laughs> things that were published yesterday or a year ago or 10 years ago, right? So you need to juxtapose the new result with old results, even if they are anomalous, even if they're different, like, oh, what I found is different from what this person found. You still need to engage in conversation with this person, right? Well, why do you think, you know, if, if anything, to just successfully navigate through the peer review process, right? One of the reviewers is like, well, hey, this paper published two years ago found this, but you didn't find that. Why do you think you didn't find the same thing? 
Um, so it's necessary to move successfully through peer review, um, and also, uh, you know, for a, a lot of us, documenting conflicting results, like in the literature, right, is a common hook, like a way we find, you know, a dissertation taught, like, oh, some people say this, some people say that, well, you know, what really is the answer? Let me adjudicate between these two. Um, so we, we often see past results in deep conversation, like uh, w new results in deep conversation with past results. Okay, and so for this reason, we think that papers that share a new result will actually be more on the consolidating end, the more incremental building very much in conversation flurry of activity than the disruptive end creating a bend in the road and changing the conversation. So we think new results are gonna be less disruptive and, and more consolidating. And we also, this deep, deep thoughts about this, think that new theories, this is the other next kind of novelty, right? First one's new result, this one's new theories. We think new theories are also going to be more, papers that present a new theory are going to be more consolidating rather than disruptive. New theories build upon, engage with, and refine previous work and draw attention to it. Um, it is difficult for those who apply a new theory. So never mind about there are people who develop theory and there are people who, um, or a, a, a given paper might uh, um, apply a theory, right? You could develop a theory, you could apply a theory. So the second sentence here is about those who apply. It's difficult for those who apply new theory to separate it completely from its foundations. It is also difficult to apply a new theory as is because concepts stretch and theories evolve. Um, this is a brilliant paper, um, Kuchenius et al. I think it's in research uh, policy, um, and it's about, uh, gosh, I haven't read this paper in a long time. I think it is uh, a focus on um, Mark Granovetter's, does anyone know, strength, strength of weak ties? And how how the, the just kind of the 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 idea and the theory in different realm like it just it 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 changes it changes upon application um so iterations of theoretical development um remain connected okay concepts stretch and theories evolve and so these iterations of theoretical development re remain uh connected uh i think it's lakatosh is that correct pronunciation, um, says any scientific theory has to be appraised together with its auxiliary hypotheses and initial conditions, et cetera, and especially together with its predecessors so that we may see by what sort of change it was brought about. Any, any scientific theory needs to be appraised together with its predecessors. Talks a lot about T, theory, you know, T prime, right, being the new theory, and theory, theory T being the original theory, and how it is, uh, these are often in very deep engagement with each other. Okay, so given new theory's role in connecting generations of scholarship and its tendency to be modified upon application, it changes strength of weak tie. And what does that kind of mean? Might mean something something different in different contexts. We expect that new paper that papers presenting new theories will be more consolidating and less disruptive. I was thinking a little bit. I wonder if I have time. Um, question, question, um, Alex. Yeah. Then in the yeah. short term, I would assume that you know maybe one of them would be consolidated, and people will be prevalent to one of the two. That's right. So in the end, one might win out. So in the short, that's an interest. That's a uh, yeah. So in the short term, you maybe agree that uh, new theories may have a consolidating effect, but in the longer term, maybe more disruptive. If there really is this, the only so much room for so many explanations in the social world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we could probably test that. That's really interesting. Other comments, questions at this point? Okay. I mean, the example I think of from, from how, how many, are, is it, maybe not many people know this, so that I won't go, give the example. how many sociologists are in the crowd? A handful? You know, sta status attainment theory, like Blau and Duncan status attainment theory? Okay. That's, I think, the prototypical example of a kind of a consolidating new theory, right? Where people really did build build upon it, right? Um, initially, like, you know, it, uh, yeah. So I won't go into detail, not many people know it, doesn't make sense, but I, I'm sure we can think of other examples from, um, from our own fields. Okay. 
Um, maybe I lost the power here. Let's see. Yeah, maybe it doesn't. Let's see. Maybe I could use a mouse or something. Magical powers. Oh, no. I could try to go backwards. No. Oh, cool. It's magic. Thank you. Um, last type of novelty. First one is new results. Second one was new theories. What about new methods and techniques? We think that new methods are the type of novelty that will be more disruptive. Uh, new techniques, new instruments, new methods tend to be widely applicable. So quickly absorbed into non-methodological writings through which the methods are passed on, right? So com someone comes up with a new technique, a new fit statistic, a new index, a new instrument or technique, and those techniques are widely applicable, and the techniques then kind of get, get um, passed on through those non-methodological writings. Uh, new techniques and instruments also tend to be static, or at least more static than theories, right? Theories stretch, theories evolve upon application. They mean different things. How people um, uh, you know, think about and pay attention to kind of the strength of weak ties differs in different uh, subfields or, or fields, right? But in contrast, methods are more static. So unlike theories, they rarely evolve in the application process. You can pick them up and move them and apply them to a new context as is. Um, so there is less of a need for users to cite the foundational work um, that gave rise to the new method, right? Once the new method is produced, you can just kind of pick it up and, and take it to where you need it and apply it as is. And new methods are also often transported across disciplinary lines. I think of a lot of the methods that we use in sociology have come from other fields, right? There have been sociologists who literally like just imported um, sequence analysis might be the, the, um, uh, uh, a really good example. So interdisciplinary offerings may be more creative and useful to scholars uh, and their foundational work um, may also be less known to the users. So um, if sequence analysis is brought, brought into sociology uh, from genetics, right, what are the chances that a sociologist reading the sequence analysis paper or using sequence analysis um, is going to go cite that foundational work from genetics that you know Andy Abbott cited and read and digested? They're probably just going to cite Andy Abbott. Right? And so it's this kind of cross-disciplinary nature of new methods that we think also contributes to um, uh, the uh, new methods papers being more disruptive than consolidating. Okay, questions or comments before we move into the data? Yeah, Yota. Um, so it's really interesting. I was, I'm very curious for your thoughts about how the really different novelty uh, types, yeah. types yeah. interact. Yeah. Say that R and D investments yeah. have this return, and this is a new result of the field. Yeah. Of economics of innovation. Yeah. Right? Yeah. How, yeah. How are they related? So yeah. 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 Um, and that is related to the data. So you can answer this question. We'll give you the data. You can answer this question. We do not answer this question, but it is possible because, very importantly, um, the types of novelty that we are looking at are not mutually exclusive. So it is possible for a paper to one paper, you may be thinking about kind of a, a series of papers, but it is possible for one paper to say, oh, like, hey, I'm presenting this new method, or I have this new measure of some concept you're interested in, and voila, it leads to a new result, right? Or helps me um, uh, develop a, a more nuanced or refined theory, right? So a, a paper can be novel in multiple kinds of ways, and we do not capitalize that on that in this paper, but one could. Hierarchy, like what's at the top, like a better type of novelty. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, theoretically, yeah. Mm. I don't know. Um, I don't know. Um, Yang Lu. Yeah. 
Really good question. We, um, we do not, we do not, but one of the qualitative topologies that we rely on is a paper in ASR by Michelle Lamont and Gregory Maillard and Josh Getzko. It was published in 2004, and the title of the paper is something about originality. What is originality in the social sciences or something like that? And they develop a topology, and they have more types of novelty than we look at here in this paper. And my recollection is one of them is new data. And especially for some fields, I'm thinking like ecology, <laughs> right? Like, hey, I found a new pond. Like, this is my new pond, like, or new kind of data. Um, in some fields, may very well be a very prominent type of novelty in that field that we, we did not look at here, but uh, one probably could. Good question. Other questions, comments, thoughts? Yeah, no. Okay. Oh, did I skip one? No. Okay, it was just a little sticky. Okay, so to understand the nature of impact, we're not looking at level of impact, we're looking at the nature of impact. It is critical to study papers that meet some minimum threshold on the amount of impact, right? You can't have impact of a certain kind without having any impact, right? You have to have some minimal, minimal level um, of uh, uh, impact to look at the nature of that impact. And so what we do is we use um, a sample of highly cited papers. These highly cited papers, there are about 2,500 of them. They are called citation classics. They were deemed citation classics by Eugene Garfield, the founder of the Web of Science. Um, these citation classics, they, the, the, the paper, once it, after it was published, after it met a discipline-specific threshold, right, for number of citations, the little bell would go off, ding, 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 and Eugene Garfield would probably send you snail mail because it was the only thing available back then, or maybe a phone call, say, hey, your paper is a citation classic. Like, for your field, it's a small field in math, so to, you know, become a citation classic in math, you know, you, you, maybe you need, I, I don't know, like 50 citations, 75 citations. Other fields, it's like 500 or 1,000, right? And so he would uh, call, call, you, call you up and say, your, your paper is a citation classic, um, and it would be deemed a citation classic. And uh, these citation classics are published in 715 different journals, and they represent all fields except the um, arts and humanities. Uh, there were just only one or two, um, so we omitted them. Um, and this approach provides sufficient rare events um, uh, that, you know, the event being kind of reaching profound intellectual influence, becoming a citation classic to study. We couldn't, in other words, we couldn't take a random sample of papers, right? Um, it, would be, it, would be, it would be challenging. Um, so we use two types of data, qualitative data and quantitative data. The qualitative data are the text of citation classics essays, and these are used to capture novelty claims. Okay, so our key independent variable, the type of novelty comes from this qualitative data. Um, essays written by the authors of these citation classics, okay, about their work. The quantitative data come from the web of science, and these citation patterns, both forward and backward citations, are used to measure the nature of impact or disruptiveness, which is our um, key outcome. So the qualitative data, um, I'm in love with these data. They are publicly available. They're on a website. Like my very first um, National Science Foundation um, grant uh, did a deep qualitative dive, kind of you know manual hand coding into these essays, um, and here um, uh, we use them again. The they are one page essays written by authors of these citation classics. Like Eugene Carfield, you know he called you up, or wrote you a letter, and said your papers, your your article has become a citation classic. Will you pre please write a one page essay about you know the challenges of writing this work and you know how it got started. What is your origin story? Why do you think your work was so useful to so many people? Will you please reflect? They're, they're one page, each one. You couldn't go over a page. They're fascinating. They are hilarious. They, they make you cry. They're, they're, you know, all the trials and travails of conducting research and really represent, you know, the subjective side of, of, of science um, in this really beautiful way. Um, they are third bullet down, written years, uh, decades after the article of publication, um, or the article was published, right? So the article was published, and on average, the essay was written 18 years later. Sometimes it was 10 years later, sometimes it was 15, 15 someone it was more. Um, and they allow us to get at claims or accounts, as I mentioned. Um, they are old. 
the, site, the, the essays were published between 1977 and 1993, so the articles they are referring to are even older than that. Okay, so the data are old, for better or worse, but they are publicly available, um, but uh, kind of underutilized. So these essays are the text from which we um, uh, capture or measure type of novelty, the key, the key um, independent variable. Here's an example. I cut off the bottom half just so it would fit, but this is a citation classic essay. So the original article was published in Diabetes in 1963. The authors are Morgan and Lazarow. And in 1977, this one-page essay was published by one of the authors, Professor Carl Morgan, Department of Anatomy. Okay, so you can see there's like an abstract in bold, and then there's usually about, I don't know, six, seven, eight paragraphs of text about the, the work. Okay, so how do we measure novelty? Um, we build on topologies developed by Dirk and also the um, Getzko et al. paper that I had mentioned earlier on originality, and this allows us to capture novelty even when it didn't emerge via recombination. So we can, we can. This is one of my frustrations, right, with the recombinant innovation literature, right? That um, oh, that's that's novel. That's novelty. That's where novelty comes. That's how it comes about. Um, and so we uh, can. Uh, um, capture different types of novelty, new result, new theory, new method, the three types of novelty that we study here, not new data. Um, two key differences from our uh, some previous work in this area is that um, we rely on first-person accounts in the essays. It's, it's the author doing the talking and the reflecting, right? Not, say, reviewers' assessments, like proposal reviewers. That was the ASR paper on originality. They talked to, you know, people who had just reviewed proposals, said, oh, which one do you think was more novel? Why? You know, what was, what was it? So, right, it was other people talking about other evaluators' assessments of a work. This is the author's assessment of their own work their own perception of it. And um, we focus on these retrospective essays on what was done rather than planned activity. Again, if you're evaluating proposals, it's like, so what, you know, is it novel? What someone plans to do in the future? So a couple key differences from this earlier work. Um, and we think that um, this enhances the, the validity of our, um, uh, uh, the, you know, the data and the, the measure that we use. Okay, so how do we measure novelty? Um, we use dictionaries, right? Um, we, they are ba basically, it's, it's you know, hard coding, manifest coding. We rely on um, searches for like regu regular expressions of synonyms for novelty. Okay, so we, we develop and iteratively refine a dictionary for each code. Um, we use kind of like in a you know, semi-supervised machine learning kind of way, we use some equivalent out of sample data um, to, for, to develop the, the, the synonyms, the list of synonyms or the, the dictionary. We don't want to call it a classifier because it's not, we're, we're not, it's not technically a classifier, um, but these dictionaries, or maybe we should actually call it a thesaurus. Everyone calls them dictionaries, but it seems more like a thesaurus to me. Um, and we rely on regular expressions and a, a few Python packages to be able to do this, to kind of you know, work through and identify these keywords from the text. Um, we tag relevant sentences in the essays. Remember, the, I showed you the picture of the essay, right? Each essay has lots of sentences in it. We went through and, and coded at the sentence level. Okay, for those who have kind of, you know, traditional coding experience. And we identified po false positives as well, developed exclusion lists, right? So, you know, the word new, if we see that in a sentence, we're like, oh, ding, ding, okay, that means that sentence is about novelty, but not if it's followed by, you know, Jersey or York or Delhi, right? Um, uh, and just as an example, this isn't the, the, these aren't the entire dictionaries, but a kind of a subset of some of, some of the, our synonyms for novelty or new, and some of the synonyms we use for method. And a sentence gets tagged as, oh, this sentence is talking about a new method if that sentence contains both a synonym for new and a synonym for method. So it has to be both in the same sentence. It can't be in the essay, like, oh, they talk about new up here and they talk about method here, and so then, oh, well, it has to be in the exact same sentence, okay? Even though we then aggregate up to the citation classic essay level and have that, presumably, they're talking about the article, so we use it as an art, you know, article level measure. So we apply these finalized dictionaries or um, thesauri to the real data Right? We used kind of some out of sample data to develop them. And the real data are these essays, these citation classic essays that contain over 90,000 sentences. And there are some examples of coded sentences there. Um, 
So the new theory example is the shortest. I'll share that one for the sake of time. A theory was developed to account for rolling textures in cubic metals. Okay, um, and so um, that's an example of a sentence coded as new theory, right? I think, um, yeah, yeah. Then we aggregate those coded sentence, sentences to the essay level. We dichotomize them. We ignore the frequency. So it doesn't matter how many sentences talked about new method in the essay. As long as one sentence talked about new method in the essay, then the whole essay and thus the article is considered to be a new method, okay? Um, and, um, you know, Tom, the codes are not mutually exclusive. A, a paper could be novel in multiple ways. Okay. The author's view of novelty type aligns with the scientific community views. Okay, so this, is, this was a summer's worth of work um, to appease a reviewer. Um, they said, well, uh, you know, maybe the author's wrong. Maybe the author's wrong. The author says, I developed a new theory, but nobody else thinks they developed a new theory. <laughs> so who cares? And so what we did is we matched our data, um, our 2,500 articles with Microsoft Academic Graph data and full text, including the citation. They're not classics. They're called citation contents. These are the sentences in the full text of a paper when, when when people, cite, when people cite one of these citation classics, right, we go in and grab from MAG the sentence, right, in which the citing author is talking about the citation classic. So when they talk, when they cite you know, the citation classic and it's in parentheses, what's the, what are the words around that? And we applied our classifier to that text. And thank goodness um, it, it aligns, right? So when the, when the, when the, when the author in the essay says, hey, I developed a new theory. It is also the case that members of the scientific community citing that work talk about that work as a new theory. Okay, so one short slide, a summer, <laughs> a huge appendix in the article, um, and a finally happy uh, reviewer. Okay. Um, for the outcome variable, we rely on web of science uh, data, metadata, um, backward citations for uh, backward, or, you know, references, uh, the, the bibliography, what's in the bibliography, forward citations, right, the people citing the citation classics. Um, and I have to thank Cadre at um, the Ind Indiana University's Network Science Institute for access to these data. And they are the numeric data that we use to measure our outcome, which is the nature of impact, not the amount, not the number of citations, right, it's the nature. So um, how do we measure disruption? Um, my co-author, uh, Russ, Russ Funk, um, and his advisor, uh, who actually got his PhD from my department, but we didn't overlap. He got his PhD just about the time I arrived as a new professor. Um, but they teamed up um, and wrote a paper in management science in 2017. Uh, and they developed this thing called the CD index. Okay, um, And C stands for consolidating. D stands for disruptive. Um, it's actually not true. You know what the D stands for in this original paper? Does anyone know? It stands for um, destabilizing. Because some reviewers of management science, some of the visible would say, uh, this isn't disruption. This isn't like Clayton Morris. Uh, this isn't disruption in the typical, you can't call it disruption. You have to call it, dest you know, they say, okay, we'll call it, you know, shake things up, the bend in the road, you know, destabilize a stream of knowledge. Um, but then everybody who has used this measure, the CD index, since then, that not only did they call it disruption, they've kind of renamed it um, uh, <laughs> the disruption, disruptive index, right? Um, so the nature of impact varies along a continuum ranging from consolidating to disruptive, and the CD index relies on citation patterns to quantify the extent to which a focal paper, think of the citation classics we're studying, increases or decreases reliance on its predecessors its references. Is it bringing attention to the predecessors in a consolidating kind of way, or is it drawing attention away from those predecessors, right? The shoulders of the giants that you stood on to develop your paper, you, maybe maybe it's some. Um, and uh, this is for you, Yotam. I kept it in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, this is a really nice picture. We have, this is a very, very rare in the data. Very, very, these are the ideal typical extremes of this continuous measure um, uh, index uh, called the CD index that my co-author um, Russ Funk developed, maximally consolidating. Uh, Dashan talked about this in his talk uh, yesterday, right? A maximally consolidating uh, light gray diamond on the left, right? Um, both of these papers are cited by 
um, six, so we're kind of controlling for number of citations. Six papers cite each focal paper. The focal papers are the gray, right? Um, and they each themselves cite four papers. They have four papers in their bibliographies, right? On the left, the consolidating paper, paper is very much in keep, keeping, keeping the conversation going, right? Maintaining attention to that prior foundational work that is the red, the red diamonds. But the maximally disruptive paper, again, um, like very rare in the data, right? This is ex at absolute extreme. The maximally disruptive paper is creating the bend in the road. It is like, right, it's, it's, it, um, it's not reinforcing the prior work or drawing attention to it. If anything, it's drawing attention away from it, right? So people are starting to start cite the focal paper, but ignoring on the right-hand side those, those references, the four red things. Questions, comments? Uh, Just, Jonas. So I'm saying this correctly that um, the, this index only like, compares the words that cite you and like, uh, their citation. Yes. Uh, it doesn't yes. look like the field overall. That's right. That is right. That's right. Okay. That is you correct. Out of your field and then you're only cited by people in your field. Yes. Um, 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 yes, and there is one way we address that in this paper that I, uh, I will, I think I will cover in a robustness check site. Yeah, 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 a way to get at that very, yeah, perceptive of you. Um, okay, you can measure this. You can take a snapshot of the, of the network of forward and backward citations at any time you'd like, right? Um, and the time that we chose is in the year 2017. And that's just to give, give these um, uh, papers not just enough time to be cited because they're old papers, but we wanted to be sure to measure our outcome variable um, much later in time than our key um, independent variable, right, which was measured from the, the essays, right? So we used 2017. And it ranges from negative one to one. Most consolidating is negative one. Most disruptive is one. Um, and some summary statistics. Um, so I have on the... Left column, just our sample of 2,500 articles. And in the right column, um, all papers in the web of science for that kind of same, um, uh, uh, I don't know if this is the exact same time frame that we study. I think it is. Um, we see the CD index, the minimum is the same, the maximum is the same, um, the standard deviation is very comparable, and what is different is the average CD index in our sample is um, uh, higher, right? Um, again, nowhere near one, right? <laughs> average CD, right? That's very, very rare value, um, but it is it is higher. So the papers that we study are more disruptive than papers uh, on average, okay? And I think because they're citation classics, uh, maybe that's uh, to be to be expected. Quick a recap on the hypotheses. So new results and new theories, we accept, expect them to be less disruptive, more consolidating, and it's the new methods that we really expect to be kind of the you know, uh, conversation changers, creating the bends in the road. All right, so just descriptively, a couple of kind of like some, you know, just to get to know the data a little bit, the vast majority of Citation Classic articles we study are described by their authors as novel. Right, so again, we're saying claims or accounts, like did the author say in their essay right, that their citation classic was novel? Um, the vast majority of citation classic articles are considered to be novel by their authors, but the type of novelty varies considerably. These don't add up to 100%. Uh, who asked the question? Yo, Tom, right? Because they're not mutually exclusive. Okay, so a paper can be um, can share a new result and or a new theory and or a new method. And then um, on the outcome side, kind of the impact side, by design, the articles that we are studying are all high impact. They're all citation classics, right? They've all been cited a lot, but the nature of impact varies. So within 10 years, some papers are very consolidating. They have negative, on the CD index, about negative 0.5, and others um, uh, reach this, this rare maximally disruptive um, score of one. And then bivariate um, results, um, just a series of t-tests and some graphs that I'm not going to show you, support our hypotheses, right? Um, new methods, for example, um, appear to be more disruptive than papers that don't present a new method. Okay, that's hypothesis three. 
And then here are the results of um, uh, some multivariate models. This is an OLS regression of the CD index, or the outcome is the CD index that ranges, ranges from negative one to one. And we are regressing that outcome variable on the type of novelty, right? You know, indicator variable for new method, new theory, new result. We don't need a reference category, right? Because these are not mutually exclusive. Um, we don't need to leave one out. And then we control for a, a, a host of different things. And what we find, at least without the controls, does this work, right? That new results have a negative effect on the CD index. So new results tend to be more consolidating. That's what we hypothesized. New theories also tend to be more consolidating and less disruptive. And new methods are the ones that are positive and statistically significant have a positive effect on the CD index. So new methods tend to be more disruptive. The one, once we control for a bunch of things, the new result um, loses statistical significance, comes back in when we do an instrumental variable um, analysis, um, but still not a huge coefficient. So we have gazillion robustness checks. Um, Jonas, this one's for you. Measure the CD index based only on intradisciplinary citations. Right? So we kind of recalculate, we, we, constrained, we constrained the set of you know, citing papers and cited papers to those within one's field, right? And calculate a like disciplinary C index. So one could per potentially be disruptive within one's field, but you know, not disruptive you know, uh, what, across one's field or something like that. Um, and the, the, what we find are uh, robust to that. Uh, measuring the CD index at different times, removing outliers. Um, oh, yeah, we did a um, Heckman selection model. We found some, we did some matching and, and found some kind of non-citation classics to, to study that weren't, as, weren't nearly as highly cited as the citation classics. Um, we did uh, used instrumental variable regression. We, um, oh, this group might be interested in this uh, mediating variable of interdisciplinary research, right? Part of the theorizing of the new method effect was that they're very, new methods and techniques are very portable, especially across disciplinary lines, right? Um, and so maybe that's one of, the, one of the mechanisms by which new methods um, are disruptive. And, um, uh, it matters, but it's not the whole story. It's not a complete mediation is what we find. So there's, there's more to it, but interdisciplinarity is part of it. Okay, to summarize, new results are more consolidating, at least in the bivariate. And once we have the controls, it, it kind of um, goes away. Okay, um, new theories are also more consolidating. Um, subsequent theorists extend, elaborate, synthesize theories. Um, and subsequent uh, empirical efforts, even if you're not a theorist, right? You know, uh, uh, if you're just applying the theory um, to your empirical work, um, those folks test them against other prior theories as well. So theories and their offshoots, the T, the T and T primes, are highly connected. And the example I mentioned earlier is the status attainment theory um, in sociology and its extensions and variants, right? There's a um, kind of a whole flurry of work about kind of, you know, adding on to this theory and refining it and um, new nuance. And the kind of key takeaway is that the new methods are uh, papers are the ones that are most um, disruptive relative to these other types of novelty. And we think this is because new methods are widely applicable, very portable, often across uh, disciplinary lines. And scholars using a new method um, rarely cite its foundational work. Think of sequence analysis and Andy Abbott, right? When a sociologist uses sequence analysis. Um, another example might be my former colleague, Charles Reagan, who developed qualitative comparative analysis, QC. I don't know how many of you know QCA. Um, uh, I've used QCA. When I use QCA, I cite Charles. <laughs> He's my former colleague. He's a sociologist. I've read his work. But I do not know the Quine-McCluskey algorithm um, published in 1965, which was critical to Charles in developing his new method of QCA, right? So just another example of, of um, one of the, the kind of uh, routes by which new methods become disruptive, right, is that the people using the method are just ignorant. We just don't know of that foundational work. It's, it's in another field, perhaps. It's uh, too technical perhaps, right? Charles figured it out so that the rest of us don't have to. Okay. Short answer, um, the question I posed, right? What kinds of novelty are most disruptive? It's the title of the paper. The answer is new methods, 
right? As we just talked, they tend not to evolve with application, they're portable, um, and they tend to have the most disruptive impact on scientific knowledge. Um, I'll just talk about the first bullet here, um, partly for Petri. Um, the better, uh, what we do here is better connect theories of scientific change. Um, and these theories of scientific change come from philosophy, they come from history, they come from sociology. We did a deep dive into a lot of these theories of the kind of evolution of science, and we really tried to connect them with um, our empirical work in the science of science, right? And um, so that was, um, it's just a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. I'm, I'm delighted. A lot of my favorite papers end up being file drawer papers, but this is one of my favorite papers that other people seem to like too. So, um, so that's nice. It's going gonna, it's gonna to see the light of day. Um, some extensions we might do, happy to talk about those later, but I think, especially so we have time for questions, just um, end here and thank NSF and um, Mike Park and others and open it up for questions. Thank you. Uh, yes, is that Dashun? Um, uh, oh. we did do some look, we did do some look, I, uh, and I, I, of disciplinary differences, um, I don't think they made it into the paper, and I think the reason they made it into the paper is because there were not many disciplinary differences, but I would have to check that, Dashun. One of the things that we did do, but this also, the reviewers didn't care for it, and we just pulled it out because there was an, a lot of other things to do, is we separated, and this might be getting at part of what you're getting, um, we called it big theory and little theory, for, for lack of a better word. A big theory is like a theory, you know, like like explaining something. A little theory might just be like, oh, I have this like new hypothesis that no, you know, no one's right. Something a little a little dinkier. Um, and uh, uh, again, we didn't find too many differences between big and little theory, so we just said, okay, let's just call it, we'll just lump them together. So yeah, yeah. Would you expect maybe new theory in the physical sciences to be? Disruptive. Theory is so important for everybody, but it means different things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is, yeah. And the role is different. Yeah. And in physics, for example, yeah. I can see it will be extremely consolidated. I mean, it was actually quite more and more interesting. I didn't expect it. I was like, oh, I think yeah. it makes a lot of sense yeah. because the reason you have yeah. theory is because there's a massive amount of new empirical evidence right. that digest. 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 But for yes. Science, Yeah, um, we could take another look at that easily. Yeah, yeah. Other questions or Jens? Your name? Yes. Um, I was wondering. I was wondering if um, I, the the changes you're seeing, like for instance, you, you saw the overall CD score changed from 0 0.05 in all of Web of Science to 0.1 in your sample. Yeah. Uh, is, is this the kind of difference that you're seeing, that, that it's just the averages moving a little bit? Or if you looked at it from a dichotomous point of view, like uh, uh, there have been some people, they, they set a threshold, if it's above 0.75, it's considered disruptive. Mm. Um, mm. It, so if you classified mm. the papers as either disruptive, consolidating, or anything in between, mm. would that also change? Mm. Or is it, um, because I think there's a fundamental difference, right? Mm. Is, is there really a difference between scoring 0.1 and 0.2 mm -hmm. versus being mm -hmm. all the way out there uh, yeah. at, at yeah. the end of the scale? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not a huge fan of cutoff. I think part of the challenge with cutoffs is like what you know where 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 do you decide, right? Where the cutoff. But I also know, I mean, uh, I mean one of the key outcomes in science of science right is like, you know, I I I, I attribute this to Brian Utzi, the 2013 science paper, right? Like, you know, hit paper. What's a hit paper? Hit paper is top 5% in the citation distribution, right? Where do 5% come from? Who said that? Who said what if you're in the top 6%? Wouldn't you be sad that you weren't a hit paper? You know, like, where, where do you draw the line? Um, but, uh, so I understand, I understand that, um, and it's not something that we, we, we looked at. We, we certainly could, 
draw the line somewhere and say, let's look at the top and the bottom of the percentile, the you know, high D, high C, and everything in between. Um, we could. Yeah. 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 Roberta. Roberta. Hi. Hi. Yeah, the, the paper on review papers, yeah, yeah. Which I think shows that literature reviews are often cited more than the work they cite, right? So I was just wondering, would that mean that literature reviews would score high with the CT index or...? Review papers. Do we, do we have some review papers um, in our sample? There are some citation classics that are review papers. Um, oof, do I just know this off the top of my head? Um, I, I do not think that they are more disruptive. I think, if anything, they are more consolidating than regular empirical papers, right, empirical studies, They're, that review papers are more, have a more consolidating effect on the stream of knowledge rather than a disruptive effect. My finding, uh, wasn't the McMahon and McFarland paper also that what, what review papers tend to do is highlight, bring, bring more light to like a subset of the article, like they review like 50 articles, right? But they kind of coalesce attention around a smaller subset of them, right? The previous work. So they're partially or, you know, disruptive in a, in a segmented kind of way, right? Or, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, interesting. I appreciate the links uh, that you're making. Yeah, yeah, I tried to do that too. It's a great paper. Oh, I'll just shout. I'll just shout. Uh, thank you so much. I'm from the arts and sciences, so I was kind of sad to be excluded from <laughs> there were just not enough of you. We need more of you. <laughs> um, but, but I was a little curious because at the beginning of your talk, uh, you talk about how uh, the sort of general disruptive nature of the scientific contributions are falling. Uh, yes. So this graph. Yeah. And then I expected that you would provide an explanation. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately not. <laughs> No, it does not. The the a partial answer, a preliminary answer to that question is in the Nature paper that I did not talk about today. I just uh, just uh, shared with you the general descriptive trend that we that we documented. Um, we did in that paper start to look at some possible explanations. We're able to rule a lot of the a lot of things out. The thing that we are not able to kind of rule out that does seem to matter is not the overall volume of scientific work that is out there. Right? It is the um, uh, kind of uh, it's our ability to um, not just, well, yeah, to digest that whole volume, to be able to walk, we were just talking about this this morning, um, the disciplinary space, right, to, to, or, you know, multidisciplinary space, right, knowledge space, to be able to use um, uh, uh, a greater variety of the work that is being published as the information aid, whatever, and there's more and more stuff out there, Right, we tend to focus and become, become pretty pretty specialized and narrow um, to our detriment if we want to produce disruptive work. Yeah. yeah. Jacob? Yeah, can I, can I wait for the microphone? No, we, we can hear shout. you. Okay. Um, I'll, I'd, I'd like to ask you to perform a, a kind of exercise in consolidation. Dance. <laughs> One of the things that I noticed in, in the sort of setup of the paper is when it comes to thinking about consolidation versus disruption, the connection to the larger um, history and philosophy of, of science is, is fairly clear. When it comes yeah. to the types of novelty, the, yeah. the linkage yeah. is a little bit looser. We have Hume, who doesn't want to make this distinction, mm -hmm. and maybe should. Mm -hmm. um, we mm -hmm. have the, the Gusko and, and Lamont paper, mm -hmm. which has a slightly different typology and also exists a little bit outside of this Yes. And so I was just thinking about how to make that connection. I mean, there are, there are bits of maybe Latour or, or Randall Collins that do some of this. 
but I was wondering how you think about it. The types of novelty? Yeah, as a, in, in connection with the sort of larger yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. tradition. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I feel like we kind of took a middle road. I did, I was telling Petri earlier, like really reread a lot of this classic kind of, you know, um, so, sociological theory about scientific change and scientific progress and scientific growth with these, uh, with these ty this typology in mind, right? Rereading things again with this new, new framework, right? Um, and uh, um, I'm, I'm not sure there was, um, I would I would say there was some consensus. I would say that um, the dominant type of novelty that people tend to look at when they just say novel, like a novel thing, a novel paper, a novel. Oh, this patent's novel. This paper's novel. This book's novel. What do they mean? They think oh, they, it came up with something new. There's a new finding or new result, right? There's this really strong focus on discovery and new results and new findings. Like that is the type of novelty, the dominant type of novelty. Um, there's also talk um, um, in, in Kuhn and elsewhere, um, Lakatosh, especially on theory, um, Methods, not so much. I feel like that was one of the things where we're like, wow, you know, I feel like the, the, the role of new methods, the role of, and especially there are a lot of people here in computational social science and you know, doing NLP and agent-based model, like, you know, a new, a new method, you know, comes to be available and like what effect does it have, right, on the type of work that we are able to um, produce. So that was maybe one of the newer, so the new result was kind of classic and, and, and dominant, right? New method was kind of the, the newer one. And then, as I was mentioning to um, um, Yang Lu, the, um, uh, uh, um, there are other folks like Dirk um, um, and the Lamont paper that builds on that, and they have a much larger topology, much more refined and elaborate topology of different types of novelty, including new data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure I fully answered your question, but yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, comments, questions, other thoughts? We're over, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.